Well, hey there. Thanks for watching this video. In case you don't know me, my name's Cade, and I'm here to help you follow Jesus. American Christianity likes to paint this picture of Jesus as this super nice guy who was politically correct and never required too much of you. Well, we've been duped. <laughs> the reality is, when we don't know Jesus, we don't know God. Because scripture tells us that God is revealed through Jesus. That's why I'm bringing you this video. By the end of it, you're going to know Jesus better than you did before. Before we jump into this message, be sure to like this video and subscribe so you'll be notified when the next video comes out. Well, we ended last week in the middle of a story. A man at the pool of Bethesda was asked by Jesus if he wanted to be well, and thank God he decided to line up his will with God's will, and he got up and he was healed after being paralyzed for 38 years. That's a long time, isn't it? This seems like such a great ending to the story. Like, I wish I could just tell you guys that he rode off into the sunset and everybody lived happily ever after. But that's not how the story ends. It continues in an unexpected way. But first, let's review where we were. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. And he took up his bed and he walked. We're in John chapter 5, verse 8. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews, therefore, said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. So this man got healed from something that he was suffering with for 38 years. You'd think the religious people would celebrate with him. I mean, aren't religious people about doing good things? But nope, the religious people, the Jews, they responded to this miracle with a scowl on their face. Like, how dare you get healed and clean up your mess on the Sabbath? How dare you? And last week, we had eight people come up at the end of service and be anointed so that they could step into a healing ministry that's been stirring on the inside of them. And I have a word for you guys from this story right here. So if that's you, or if you were one of those eight people, go ahead and stand up if you're here. Got a word for you guys. Yeah, give him a hand. The healer's in the room. So when this man first got healed, he was really excited, right? After 38 years of being paralyzed, he was really excited. Just like you guys were probably really excited after you got anointed last week. Yes, I'm going into my ministry. But right after the man was healed, he was confronted with religious people. And they tried to steal his excitement. They tried to trip him up. So did you leave here excited last week and then immediately uh, get confronted with something that tried to steal your excitement or somebody who tried to steal your excitement and tell you that it's not possible? Because if that happened to you, God wants you to know to ignore it. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to the lies in your mind that are telling you that nothing happened last week, that nothing's changed because something did change last week and you're stepping into a calling that he's put on your life. Don't listen to people who will tell you it's impossible. Just don't even listen to them. You step out and you be bold about what God's called you to do. I'm going to pray over you again. Oh, God, we thank you that here in our midst, you've anointed eight people to step into a healing ministry here at No Limits. And we thank you for the many, many, countless miracles that are going to happen in our midst because these have chosen to be obedient and are walking according to the call of God on their life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, go ahead and sit down. Now, this reminds me of uh, something that happened almost exactly a year ago. We were all faced with a virus that we didn't know anything about. And so the country decided to play it safe, right? We shut everything down. Can you believe it's been a year since all that took place? And you know what I remember most about when all that started? Anyone who spoke out in faith was raked over the coals. Oh my goodness. I don't think that I've ever seen faith so persecuted. And the craziest thing to me was, is it was being persecuted by other Christians. Church people were fussing at church people for walking in faith. And I was just like, wow. It was a lot like this man who got, got healed. He chose faith, but the religious rule followers, they weren't having it. They didn't want any part of it. So who, who are the religious people today? Who are they? Who, who is exalting rules over faith? Well, I think it's clear that, I mean, it's different now because we're not following the rules that are set forth in the Old Testament. I mean, how many of you guys know somebody who faithfully practices a Sabbath day rest every week? You know some people because we've talked about it before here at No Limits, but it's pretty rare. We're not following all those rules and regulations in the Old Testament. So even though it's different today, the religious spirit is still around. It just manifests itself in a different way. The religion of 2021, I believe is science and government. 
The two things that are meant to have a positive impact in our life have now become a weapon against faith. Science and government, they're they're good things when they're used correctly. But they've become their own religion. They have. Like, if they make a rule, like wearing a mask, for example, right? The religious people chastise anybody who doesn't follow along. Especially if you say that you're living by faith. And so that's why you're not wearing a mask. They don't like that at all. You know, we're told that it's foolish to choose faith over science. Has anybody heard that recently? It's foolish to choose faith over science. Like, in essence, what they're saying is the unconfirmed theories of man, the studies that man has done, a.k.a. science, are more superior than the Word of God. That's what they're saying. Well, it's quite backwards. I mean, it's actually quite foolish to exalt anything that humankind has come up with above the Word of God, above God who created this whole thing and knows what's going on. That's what's foolish. And you know, I was in the same place as everybody else a year ago. I've never lived through something like this. I didn't, I didn't know what was true, what wasn't true. So I played it safe and And I chose to move our church to online services during that time. And like everybody else, I was glued to the TV and I was waiting for the latest stats and the latest latest guidelines from the government. And then I remember like there was a very strong leading of the Holy Spirit. And he said, stop watching the news. Just stop. I mean, if there was an audible voice, like there was an audible voice. He said, just stop. So I did. A few weeks into the shutdown, I stopped watching the news and I've never watched it since. Do you know what happened to me? I began to see the situation through the eyes of God rather than the eyes of the news, or should I say the eyes of fear, right? So I turned away from the news. I began to see it from God's perspective. And you know, when I chose to go online only for our church, I wasn't fully convinced it was the right decision at the time. Like it seemed like a good decision, but there was no witness in my spirit that it was the right decision, but I did it anyways. But once I turned off the news and was able to see God's perspective, I had complete confidence in my next decision, which was six weeks later, I opened the doors of the church, and I had complete confidence in that. And we were one of the very few churches that went back so quickly, and there were a lot of people who did not like it. They didn't like it. But if you've been around since then, you've you've noticed that God is honoring us for stepping out in faith and being obedient to His Word, and it's quite amazing to watch. But I want you guys to know something. I've repented for closing down the church for six weeks because that was a mistake. And I've repented because now I see it was clear disobedience to the word of God, which tells me to never forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Never do it. Not for any reason. And it also says to fear not many times over and over and over. You should never let fear into your life. So I will never close the doors again. Mark my words. I'll never do it. Like, I'm serious, y'all. I don't care if the religious people persecute me. Like, I just don't care. I don't care if they come after me. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because it's disobedience to the word of God. And I'm not trying to, like, make anybody feel condemned or anything like that. And maybe there's another pastor watching right now, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad if your church still closed. I'm just telling my story. I've repented, and I'm not going there again. I'm not going to close the doors of the church. And this is just like the man at Bethesda. Take a look at how he responded to these religious people. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. So in other words, he was saying, I know you don't want me to take up my bed and walk, but... I'm not following religion. I'm following Jesus. He's the one who told me to take up my bed and walk. And in the next verse, we actually find out that this man didn't yet know who Jesus was because the Jews, they ask him, who's healed you? Who asked you to pick up your bed? And he's like, I don't know, because Jesus had disappeared into the crowd before they even had a chance to introduce themselves. So if this man could follow Jesus before he knew who Jesus was, surely we can follow Jesus whenever we fully know him through the word of God today. And here's what we learn in this story about following Jesus, is to follow Jesus, I must choose faith despite the opposition. Living by faith is no walk in the park. There's going to be opposition. Your circumstances will oppose you. Well-meaning people will oppose you. Man-made religion will oppose you. The government will oppose you. So you have to make a decision ahead of time. I will choose faith despite the opposition. Actually, facing opposition when you're living by faith is a good indicator that you're on the right track. 
So does this man ever find out who, that Jesus is the one who healed him? Of course he does, right? Because yes, Jesus wants you well, but more than that, he wants you to believe in him so that you can spend eternity with him in heaven. So this guy is no different. Let me show you what happens next. Afterward, Jesus found him. I love that. In the temple, and he said to him, see, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Notice that Jesus was looking for this guy. You'd think this guy would be looking for Jesus, but nope, Jesus was looking for him. Jesus found him. Isn't that beautiful? So this guy was once lost. Now he's found, and now Jesus is basically inviting him to salvation. Hey, turn from your sin and follow me, right? And we also learn in this scripture why Jesus hates sin, and he tells you to get away from it. And the reason is sin causes destruction. Sin ruins your life. Many people like to say that the destruction that comes as a result of sin is God punishing you. Nope. God's not pun- God doesn't cause the destruction. Sin causes the destruction. Let's make sure we're clear on that. God does not cause destruction in your life. Sin causes destruction in your life. For example, and I don't say this to condemn anybody, but it's one of the best examples that we can all understand. When, you, when somebody chooses to engage in sexual sin, it naturally destroys family. Like you cheat on your spouse and naturally they don't want to be with you anymore. God didn't do that. <laughs> you did that. You choose a homosexual lifestyle and naturally you can't have your own kids. You choose to have sex outside of marriage and naturally your kids, you know, grow up without united parents because you all didn't commit to each other first. I mean, all sexual sin destroys family. Why do you think the Bible is so intent on making it clear what sexual sin is and how to stay away from it? Because it destroys family. And what is life without family? What is life without family? How many of the issues that we face today are because of broken family? How many? Why does Satan work so hard to destroy family? Even parents who have chosen to stay together, the dad might invest all of his time and work and forget that he has a family and end his life without a family. Why does Satan work so hard? He just, he comes, yeah, he's here to steal, kill, and destroy. The reason is because God designed family. It's God's design. And when we commit to the way that he designed it, it creates this beautiful, joy-filled experience for the entire family, for the entire, it's kind of like a little taste of heaven on earth. And that's what God wants you to have. And If you feel a bit condemned right now because you've engaged in something that I've talked about, shake it it off. There is no benefit to wasting time in regret. There's no benefit to looking back and saying, oh, I wish I would have, could have, should have. No, that doesn't help. Heed the words of Jesus, though, where he says, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. God, God can mend your family. God can take ashes and turn them into beauty. But you have to start the process by turning away from what you've been doing and seeking God's way. I mean, wouldn't you rather live God's design and have his blessing on your family? So from this man at Bethesda, we learned this other thing about following Jesus, and that's to follow Jesus. I must resist sin. I don't embrace it. I don't celebrate it. I don't excuse it. No, I resist it. And for clarity, you should know that you're only responsible for resisting your own sin. You're not responsible for resisting somebody else's sin. Everybody say amen. Amen. This doesn't mean that you never talk to a friend about how concerned you are that they're living a life of sin. I mean, if you truly care about somebody, you have the hard conversations with them too. But it's not your responsibility to keep someone else from sinning. It's not your responsibility. Yes, you can lovingly share the truth with them. But in the end, the choice is theirs. But when it comes to resisting sin for yourself, there's one important thing that you have to know. Only Jesus gives me the power to resist sin. Like I would do you a disservice today if I didn't explain to you what Jesus has provided for you. Easter's coming up next Sunday. And what that means is that we're the, at the exact time of year when Jesus gave his life to save yours almost 2,000 years ago. So if this were the year that it all went down, today would be the day that Jesus made his journey into Jerusalem. And just like we saw earlier, as he was coming into Jerusalem, a crowd of people met him with palm branches and they were shouting. And why palm branches? Because they represent victory. These people were prophesying about the victory that Jesus was going to have a week later on Easter. And that's why today is known as Palm Sunday. Today we celebrate in advance the victory that Jesus is going to have on Easter. It's so, so, so beautiful. And then this Thursday night would be the night that Jesus had Passover dinner. 
with the disciples. And that same night, he would be arrested and he would be questioned by the high priest. He would be beaten. He would be mocked. This would all be going down on Thursday night. And then Friday morning, Jesus would have been taken before the Roman governor to be sentenced to death. And the Roman governor could find no fault in him, but the Jews pressured the governor into sentencing him to death anyways. And this all happened around 7 a.m. on Friday morning. And by 10 a.m., Jesus was being nailed to a cross. By 3 p.m., just five hours later, he was dead on the cross. Why? Why would the Son of God go through such torture? Why would he allow himself to be unjustly sentenced to death? Well, Isaiah 53, 5 tells us he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He's been beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. This is why he did it for you. Like he knew you were rebellious and sinful and had no way out of it on your own. So he stood in your place. He took it all on himself and he took on the punishment that should have been yours so that you could be made free. And don't just receive half of what Jesus died to give you. I mean, we hear a lot about forgiveness. And yes, you're completely forgiven whenever you believe in Jesus. But he did more than forgive you. He set you free. Just like it says in, in 2 Peter 1.3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Only by God's power. Are you free from sin? If you found this message helpful, you'll love my book titled Jesus Ain't Woke. In it, you'll get the confirmation you need to steer clear of wokeness in a thrilling 30-minute read. I would love to personally sign a copy and send it to you. Order your book today at kdyoung.com. If you'd like to help me get this truth out to everybody who needs it, hit the like button. It may seem small, but it really helps a lot. So hit that like button. And I'd also like to invite you to consider giving into this ministry. Simply visit kdyoung.com and you'll find a giving button there. I have more videos coming your way. Be sure to subscribe so I can let you know. And I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.